The mental model theory can be applied specifically to the way audiences understand Islam through reporting on terrorism in the news and the application of the social amplification theory. The core idea behind the social amplification framework is that an accident or an act of terrorism will interact with psychological, institutional and cultural processes in ways that may amplify or attenuate community response to the event. There are therefore many indirect impacts when the media report on an event such as terrorism and the information in the report is interpreted based on the audience's existing mental models. Depending on the mental model of the individual, this will either aid in alleviating or amplifying the risk perceived. This can also be linked to ideas about cultural trauma, whereby members of a collectivity feel they have been subjected to a horrendous event that leaves marks upon their group consciousness, marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental ways. Such events would clearly become part of an audience's mental models, and these can be reshaped or reinforced during re-representations of the trauma at anniversary commemorations. If these theories are applied to reporting on proposed MOS developments, it can be suggested that the audience's existing mental models about Islam, which may or may not be influenced by such ideas as terrorism, will impact on their risk perception of the situation. And finally, when considering Hall's encoding decoding model and Van Dyke's mental model theory, it is important to conceive of the audience in active, as active in the meaning making process. Van Dyke argues that readers do not simply register conveyed meanings but construct them. Kabir argues it is naive to believe that media messages do not impact upon readers' perceptions. Some audiences realise the effectual power of the media, although fall into the trap of the third person effect. The third person effect is an indirect media effect caused by an individual's perception that while he or she is immune to media influence, that others, the third people, are not and they therefore come to accept, approve or support media messages. Audiences often do not realise that while individuals as active agents make conscious choices and uses of media in their everyday life, they may not always be fully aware of the consequences of these choices. In this sense, they are at once active players in the media communication process, but also vulnerable, albeit unconsciously, to media messages. Therefore, they may still be susceptible to the discourses being presented in the articles. As Ang argues, audiences may be active in myriad ways in using and interpreting media, but it would be utterly out of perspective to cheerfully equate active with powerful. It is important, therefore, to conceive of the audience as active, but also of the media as powerful. Racism has traditionally been understood as related to the ethnic background of citizens and the coded societal messages and public discourses surrounding immigration and multiculturalism. Racialization has been defined as the process by which people are stereotyped by characteristics and is integrally related to power and privilege. Despite the current consensus that race is a social construct and not a real phenomenon, the use of race as a concept persists. This leads Mason to conclude that race is a legitimate concept for sociological analysis because social actors treat it as a real basis for social differentiation. In contrast to racism based on ethnicity, new racism, also sometimes described as cultural racism, moves beyond traditional categories of race and considers other minorities' identities of culture and even religion. Colette argues that while the basis of the old and the new racism has shifted, the core element of the old remains central to the new, the incompatibility to coexist. It is important to consider how racism is presented specifically through media content, such as newspaper articles, because Van Dyke has argued that speakers routinely refer to newspapers as their source and authority of knowledge or opinions about ethnic minorities. Van Dyke argues that the reproduction of racism in the press is a process of how media discourses contribute to the formation and change of social representations of the readers about themselves as a group, about ethnic minorities, and about the relation between these groups. This relation between the media, representations, and societal understandings is a collaborative one, as the media may shape how people see and understand ethnic minorities, but according to Roy Greenslade, most journalists who are responsible for racist material genuinely believe they are reflecting the views of society and therefore mirroring reality. Journalists may therefore think that it is the society they are reporting for that shapes how they write about these minorities. 
There are explicit links in the literature between Islam and racism. Manning argues that as a society we have a problem with racism and that we are ignorant about Arabs and Muslims and our politicians and media have preyed upon this. This is supported by a 2006 study by the University of New South Wales which showed that one in three Australians admits to knowing nothing about Islam and even more new things that turned out to be wrong. Racism through Islamophobia against the Australian Muslim community has been primarily expressed through opposition to proposed mosques and Islamic private schools. It is important, however, to note that Islamophobia is neither consistent nor uniform in the way that it is manifested and in the ways that it is defined. Uh, there are many different manifestations of Islamophobia which range from mild to extreme and which are expressed in different ways and it is important to consider all of these demonstrations. When considering the concept of identity, one of the most important realisations is that identity is a construct. The construction of identity is bound up with the disposition of power and powerlessness in each society and is a result of discursive practices that are always in process. Hall argues that precisely because identities are constructed within and not outside discourse, we need to understand them as produced in specific historical and institutional sites within specific discursive formations and practices by specific enunciative strategies. Moreover, they engage within the play of specific modalities of power and thus are more than the product of the marking of difference and exclusion than they are the sign of an identical naturally constituted unity. It is therefore through conceptions of the other and difference that identity is formed. Robbins argues that identity today finds itself in, reje in rejection. Therefore, identity is almost exclusively built as an opposition to something else, a not relationship. For example, not Australian. This othering can be seen in the construction of a Muslim identity through Australian newspapers. This is supported by Sayed, who argues that the construction of identity involves establishing opposites and others, whose actuality is always subject to the continuous interpretation and reinterpretation of their difference from us. Each age and society recreates its other. It is Sayed's argument in his book Orientalism that the current other for Western societies is people from the Orient, meaning people of Arab ethnic backgrounds or people ascribing to the Muslim religion. Sayyid argues that Orientalism became a focal point of identity for people from the West to apply to Arab and Muslim people, and that the attribute of being Oriental overrode any countervailing instance. An Oriental man was first an Oriental, and only second a man. Orientalism thus became a static and perpetuating marker of identity. Bauman argues that the postmodern problem of identity is primarily how to avoid this fixation and to keep your options open. This fixed identity is a problem facing the Muslim community as they continue to be stereotyped into certain fundamentalist identities. Such stereotypes are only surface interpretations of identity and they fail to look in depth at how people construct their own identities, whether that is via nationality, ethnic background, religion, gender, and so forth. It is also important at this stage to acknowledge the diversity of Islamic culture. Robbins writes, it is a question of Islam's not Islam. It is constituted of a variety of sects, movements, parties, forms of activity and points of view. Therefore, when applying labels like Muslim to a group of people, the labeler is again using simplistic categorizations that may not be appropriate or considered accurate by the person being identified. Moral panic literature centers on a threat to the fundamental moral basis of society where evil threatens the good. It is a process in which the response to an alleged social problem appears exaggerated or disproportionate to the actual threat posed. A moral panic is therefore not about real deviance or about the existence of activities. It's about activities that are classified as deviant. Uh, it is the perception of the threat that's important, not the actual threat itself, if the threat is even really present. As such, moral panics can be related to ideas about risk and specifically the cultural theory of risk perception which asserts that individuals' perceptions of risk reflect and reinforce their commitments to visions of how society should be organised. Under this theory, the society is likely to perceive a threat if the folk devil is not following cultural norms. The folk devil is the name given to the deviant group, usually referring to individuals, minorities or subcultures. Many of the ideas surrounding moral panics centre on youth groups as the folk devil, 
However, Cohen has correctly identified how notions of race can also be utilised, and it has been argued that the other or the folk devil is likely to be a vulnerable group in society. This description can certainly be applied to the Muslim communities of Australia. Another important aspect of the moral panic literature is the links made to the media, because they are a key source of risk information for the public. Hunt identifies the media itself as an especially important carrier and producer of moral panics. The media allows the issue to be reported to a wider audience than it perhaps would have otherwise reached. Van Dyke states that overreporting precisely defames an issue as a scandal or affair, and this will again spawn further reactions from politicians and others involved, which again need to be reported, and so on, thus creating what may be called the panic circle. This is referred to elsewhere as deviance amplification, whereby the media draw attention to the panic through continuing coverage. It has been suggested that in contemporary Australia we are witnessing the emergence of the Arab other as the preeminent folk devil of our time. Reasons for the moral panics surrounding Arab and Muslim people have been suggested to include fears of neighbourhood change and the formation of ethnic ghettos, as well as the links frequently made between Islam, terrorism and fundamentalism. During the moral panic, the diverse identities of Arabs and Muslims are used interchangeably, and this simplification of identity is typical of the panic process. Al Natour has looked at the controversy surrounding the proposed and later denied Islamic private school in Camden, Sydney in 2008. He states that the events at Camden show that the Arab folk devil still preys upon the moral concerns of mainstream Australia and can be depicted through the media as a threat to national well-being. This idea of national well-being is also raised by Humphrey, who argues that the moral panic around terrorism has led to the situation where any expression of Islamic religious identity is suspected as a sign of fundamentalism or radicalism, and therefore as a potential threat. In this way, the moral panic fuels itself and continues to perpetuate. Therefore, it can be concluded that the current reporting on Islam in relation to proposed mosque developments and Islamic schools in Australian newspapers is problematic. Stereotypes regarding Muslim communities are being purported through the media, leading to Orientalist depictions. It is proposed that journalists writing articles on Islam work in environments which would benefit from revisiting professional protocols for reporting on Islam with appropriate cultural sensitivity. This would allow for more respectful relationships for both individual Muslims and Muslim communities within Australian society. And I would like to apologise again that I can't be there in person uh, at the conference to answer any questions that you might have about this presentation or my larger research project. But my email address is available there on the slide. And please feel free to email me with any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you very much.